Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Nicholas Lane. Uh, welcome to the Flower Monthly May. I'm joined here by some core Flower members of the team, Daniel, Julian, and Tanner. We also have uh, in this uh, May edition, uh, Danny and Xiaoping, who are um, invited guest speakers uh, for this month's uh, edition. So thank you to them for turning up. And thank you to all of you uh, in attendance. Uh, in this exciting edition of Flower Monthly, I'm going to start by just reminding us all of the format of this Flower Monthly. This is a, um, a monthly uh, sync up of the flower community uh, that's going to that occurs on the first Wednesday every month. And then, uh, we've done a bit of a correction of the uh, the timing to be sort of more clear to run when the event is going to be occurring. So it's the first Wednesday every month, and uh, it'll be occurring at um, 4 p.m. or 1600 UTC. And so I've highlighted here on the slide, which uh, corresponds to 9 a.m. in San Francisco, 12 p.m. New York, 5 p.m. London, 9.30 in India, and midnight uh, in Beijing or China. And so that hopefully makes it clear for everyone when the times of this event will be. Um, as I've mentioned in past uh, Flower Monthly Editions, this is a, a regular informal sharing of information a venue for discussion, also an opportunity for um, uh, part of the flower team to uh, describe updates to the framework and also to invite contributions from the broader community, uh, which is exactly what we're mainly doing um, this month. Uh, as always, suggestions are very welcome for how we can improve this monthly get together. Uh, and if you want to sort of join in in some of the discussion, there is a special channel on the flowers Slack um, for the monthly um, this monthly um, meetup, and so in between monthly um, sessions, you could uh, provide suggestions if you want to sort of uh, suggest that you want to um, provide a talk to these monthly uh, events. Feel free to, to um, reach out to us on this uh, channel. So the agenda uh, for this uh, this May edition is as follows. Um, we start off as usual, the, the sort of welcome messages and outline the agenda. We're then going to do five minutes on some of the exciting things that have happened uh, with Flower this month. And I was surprised this morning when I was putting together some of the highlights, uh, just how many interesting uh, and cool things have happened to Flower in May alone. So it's really exciting. Um, I found actually I, I didn't even cover everything that had happened. I just uh, cherry picked a few of the coolest uh, um, uh, events that I want to share with you in case you might have missed it on our social channels. Uh, we're then going to do a, another five minutes just on um, the Flower Summit, which is fast approaching. This is, in fact, the last Flower Monthly before the Flower Summit um, occurs, which will be occurring at the end of this very month. So I'll just be reminding you all about uh, what's it all about and why it makes sense for you to attend either physically or virtually. Um, and then the remainder of the Flower Monthly, the, the, the meat, the meat of the Flower Monthly, this um, is going to be two technical talks, um, one by Xiaoping Zhang of the New Jersey Institute of Technology. He's going to be presenting a, a type of specification that they invented there um, for which they built this um, these experiments on specification using flour. And then we're going to conclude with uh, Danny Ma from the University of Cambridge. He's going to be speaking about uh, his uh, really fascinating approach to offering um, uh, uh, boosted trees uh, within the federated setting. And so we're going to be listening to both of these folks uh, who are offering really interesting pieces of tech that many of you might want to think about adopting. Um, so with that as an agenda, let's move forward to uh, the months in review of flower. And so I cherry picked four interesting things that happened to flower this month of May. Uh, Number one is that if you happen to be in Times Square in New York early on in May and you looked up into one of these iconic buildings, uh, you would have seen a flower billboard uh, up here. And it's being shown in animation here. Um, it was shown for three or four days. And this was due to our partnership with Brex um, because Brex is doing services for flower. As a consequence, we're unable to show this lovely animation of um, our logo and so forth in Times Square, that was really pretty cool. Um, so if anyone happened to have been there and physically uh, saw, see it, um, please reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. That would be pretty, pretty wild. 
Um, the next uh, interesting event that happened to Blower was that um, based here in Cambridge, UK, Weights and Biases reached out to us because they wanted to have a, a meetup of um, the local um, community of machine learning practitioners and students. And so um, Weights and Biases rented out a nearby bar. Uh, they were very kind to invite us along. And uh, their CEO, Lucas, presented um, some of the new Weights and Biases methods, uh, for example, that apply to um, large language models. Uh, and then we had a, a flower contributor um, Javier, Javier presented how you can use Flower in conjunction with weights and biases for doing simulations. And so you can see from these images here, um, folks from the Flower team were in attendance. There were students from the University of Cambridge. Uh, there were also a number of practitioners from nearby companies, Amazon, Microsoft, and so on, in attendance um, there to see how you can um, use Flower and weights and biases together, and also how you could um, use uh, some of the latest offerings from weights and biases. That was a really fun event to be involved with. Um, you would have also seen this month, uh, we released Flower 1.4. And so um, this release included a, a lot of um, a lot of new uh, elements that many of you would have really been uh, taken with. One of those elements uh, we're being we're hearing about today. So uh, Danny Ma's contribution about XGBoost uh, has been incorporated inside version 1.4 of Flow. We've had many examples of uh, people who needed non-neural network solutions to attack their particular machine learning problem. And so now we're happy to offer them quite a powerful approach to this. And that's just one of dozens of methods uh, and, and new forms of um, baselines, new documentation, new capabilities, uh, new experimental APIs that are all encapsulated in 1.4. And so if you happen to have missed it early part of the month, um, please visit uh, the Flower uh, website and you can see a full write-up in a blog post uh, by Charles. Um, and finally, uh, it, took, it caught us by, by surprise, but the University of Cambridge um, each year has various types of awards. And while they call this word award a product, um, it really is for any type of like a service or a um, or piece of software uh, that has having large community impact. And so um, the University of Cambridge, in particular, the Department of Computer Science and Technology, this year bestowed this award to Flower. And so unfortunately, um, uh, myself and Daniel happened to be um, available to attend and receive this award. Um, and we, we really sincerely received this award um, on, the, on behalf of the entire Flower community. Uh, it was really a wonderful that for the university to acknowledge um, Flower and how much progress it's made in the last 12 months and, and really uh, as a down payment for the progress that we foresee happening in the next uh, 12 months ahead and, and, and longer. So that was, uh, those are four interesting things that happened to Flower um, this month of May. Uh, and and uh, there were many other ones that I could have added in there too. Bit of an overview of some of the cool things that have been happening. Um, next. Flower Summit is, is really almost on top of us. Uh, I just want to remind anyone who's in attendance of this uh, really cool event. Um, it's going to take uh, place in uh, Cambridge, UK on May the 30th and 31st. And if you find it uh, not possible to attend physically, don't worry. You can attend uh, virtually via Zoom and the typical kind of like hybrid technologies. So you can still get a, a large part of the part of the action if you can't physically attend. Although I personally, if, if there's some way that you can attend even for one of the days, I would strongly recommend it um, because not only for the um, content, um, but also for the networking opportunities. Um, as we've been saying, um, our expectation is that this Flower Summit this year will end up being the largest ever uh, conference on the topic of um, federated learning. Uh, we're very excited to see if that's going to take place, but we're comfortable with this. And so please come uh, and take part in it. Um, just to summarize what you're going to see if you do happen to attend, it's a two-day event, one day focused largely on research, the other day focused largely on um, industry. Uh, I've highlighted here that uh, there'll be late start each of the days. So in terms of the UTC time zone, that'll be 12.30. Uh, in, in, uh, in the UK, that's 1.30, for example. And we'll be ending well into the evenings, and that's to uh, enable 
um, other time zones uh, to sort of be more compatible um, with the events that are taking place. If you would like to speak, uh, there's still are opportunities, a few slots are remaining. Um, so please uh, feel free to submit um, uh, a form and, and so we can see if, uh, if the talk makes sense for the topics we bring together. We also strongly recommend physically, if you're going to come register as soon as you can, because slots are filling up, you're going to see um, tutorials, how to's, industry case studies, a variety of things. It'll be physically created in the computer lab at the University of Cambridge. Um, and so don't miss out. I would um, highlight that we've uh, constructed this poster that kind of gives you a much better sense of some of the interesting things that you're going to find. Um, and so not only will you see research results um, built on flower and industry use cases built on flower, um, but you'll also see really interesting tutorials, um, such as um, how to use um, SSL, um, supervised forms of learning in federated scenarios. You're going to see uh, how to use Android and iOS clients within Flower, and you're going to see um, presentations on the need for FL standards and interoperability presented by um, a really good friend of Flower from Intel. Um, there's many folks from Weights and Biases in attended, attendance uh, showing you how you can use some of that tooling to sort of really optimize some tricky um, federated learning simulations. There's a, there's a variety of, of events um, taking place, um, and not only technical ones, but non-technical opportunities to socialize and network with folks who are like deeply committed to um, federated and collaborative forms of machine learning. And so I, I wouldn't miss it for the world. Please feel free to um, register today. Um, so that brings me to the heart of um, Flower Monthly, and that is going to be our first invited talk. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are really lucky to have um, Xiaoping Zhang of the New Jersey Institute of Technology, who is going to present to us uh, a work I believe that appeared in AAAI um, that was built on Flower. And it's a, it's a really interesting form of sparsification that's well suited for um, model pruning in the sort of genre of federated learning. And so um, with that introduction, I'm going to hand over uh, to him to, to hear about this fascinating work. Thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Um, thank you for having me here. And this is my pleasure to talk about my recent research in federated learning. So this is a paper I'm presenting, Complement Sparsification, Low Overhead Model Pruning for Federated Learning. So this paper addresses a problem of model pruning for factory learning to achieve a uh, low bidirectional communication overhead between the client and the server and the low computation overhead at the client and achieve good model accuracy. The main idea of this problem to have is to have the server and the clients collaboratively and complementarily print the models to create the sparse models to capture the global data to the data distribution and also the uh, local trends at clients. So as we know, FADR learning is uh, to preserve the privacy of the, uh, by training locally on clients. So in traditional FADR learning, we use dense and over-parameterized uh, deep learning models. And this is because uh, more over-parameterized models are easier to train, however, this over-parameterization comes at the cost of a significant memory, computation, and communication overhead. And this overhead makes it difficult to run factory learning on resource constrained mobile and IoT devices. And therefore, it is essential to reduce the overhead in factory learning while maintain the good model accuracy. So here, uh, model pruning can be a potential solution to this problem. So in model pruning, firstly, we need to train a dense model, and then we need to remove some weights to produce a sparse model. And then we need to do, fine, do the fine tuning to recover the performance loss due to the weights removal. So in this process, we cannot use it directly in factory learning 
because uh, if we do the pruning on server, server cannot perform it because uh, in fact, the learning server does not have access to the role training do data for the fine training process. And also for clients, so quite often we want to do fine training, clients are IoT or mobile devices and they are resource constrained to perform the fine training. So these are the requirements for this model pruning process for fine training learning. Firstly, we want to re reduce the size of a global model transferred from the server to the clients. And the secondly, we want to reduce the size of local updates from the clients to the server. And we do not want to reduce much communication, uh, computation or at clients. And also we want to achieve comparable model performance with the dense model trend in vanilla fat rate learning. All these requirements are under assumption that uh, the uh, in fact the learning server cannot access to to the raw data due to the privacy concerns. So this is our overview. We pro, uh, we pro propose complement specification. So firstly, uh, complement specification starts from vanilla fat rate learning, where the uh, clients train a dense model and the server aggregates the client's models from the clients. And then we want to have the server to create the sparse models. And th this process can be simply remove the low magnitude, uh, magnitude weights and send the sparse models to the clients. And in this way, the model transferred from the server to the clients uh, reduced and the communication overhead is reduced. And then we want the clients to train from the global sparse model received from the server. And, then, and uh, from the training, we can produce a new dense model, but we only send the weights that were original zero in the global sparse model. So in this way, the communication or head from the clients to the server is reduced and also the computation or head of clients is minimized. So because uh, in this process, we have the global sparse model and the uh, client sparse model complement to each other. And then we can aggregate them together to produce a new dense model, a new global dense model. And this new, uh, with this new dense model, we can repeat the st st uh, step number two, which is a reduce, which is a remove some low magnitudes of, again on the global smart model. And this way, in this way, this this process can repeat, and then we can eventually update all the weights over time. So in this uh, server aggregation process, we also want to amplify the uh, client sparse model a little bit to make sure they will not be pruned away in the in the next round, and uh, we can produce a new set of the ways to be pruned away by the by the server. So in this way, all the up, all the weights of the model can be updated over time, and then we can uh, achieve a comparable performance as vanilla feather learning in this process. So now let's look into the details. So in this system, we have a, we have a N clients and a one server. And in the initial rounds, the clients train uh, with their local data and produce the dense uh, local models, and send the local dense model local models to the server, and the server can simply average them and produce a global dense model. And then the server can do the pruning by removing some low magnitude weights from the dense model and produce a global sparse model. So here, the remaining weights are marked as green and the removed weights are marked as red. So this uh, global sparse model is also associated with a pruning mask and then the server sends the global sparse model to the clients 
and the, the clients can fine tune the global sparse model uh, received from the server with their local data again and produce new dense models. And then the clients uh, apply the inverted mask to the uh, client's dense model to produce uh, client sparse models. So this inverted mask can be either received from the uh, uh, received from the server or can be produced from the global sparse model by the clients. So in this way, we have uh, new sparse models of, from the clients and the clients can send them to the server. Server can average them. And then because of the, this uh, this uh, client average sparse client sparse model and the global sparse models of previous rounds complement each other. When we aggregate them together, we can produce a new dense, a new fourth uh, global model. So in this process, which is not uh, uh, shown in the animation here, is that we can amplify the average the client's model a little bit to make sure the weights the weights can remain. So make sure the weights will will outgrow other weights. So in the next round, and the, when we apply the uh, low magnet pruning again on the global sparse model, and we can produce a new global dense, uh, dense uh, uh, sparse model with a new pruning mask. So in this way, every round uh, we can have a different set of ways to be updated through, uh, and this communication process all use uh, sparse models bidirectional between the clients and the server, and also the the computation on the clients is very little. Just apply uh, additional, uh, just apply the inverted mask on the dense model. So in the next two slides here, I will show you some technical insights and the next slide will be some uh, uh, analysis of this process. So in the, this process, we uh, in further learning, we have clients as the server are in complementary relationship. As we see, the clients usually perturb the global model to follow their local data distribution and the server con conciliates the client's models to capture the global data distribution. So in complement sparsification, we take, the, we take one step ahead and uses complementary sparse models in this process. So in this process, we have low overhead in computation and the communication. And here uh, we have the clients to perform implicit fine tuning instead of uh, explicit fine tuning as a regular model pruning in centralized learning. In order to update all the weights over time, uh, we have uh, clients and the server aggregates uh, the, the, the complementary subsets of the models to produce a new dense model every round. And the, this process is uh, we use the uh, aggregation ratio to ensure the previous pruned weights will outgrow others and uh, all the weights can be get updated over time. So this is some a uh, little bit of analysis to show this process complements the sparsification approximates vanilla five learning. So this is our complement sparsification aggregation function here. We have a prime to denote the a sparse model and the weights without prime is a dense model. So as we see, so uh, to, to produce a new global dense model, we, uh, we uh, aggregate a uh, sparse uh, server model together with the weighted sum of the sparse uh, client's model with the aggregation ratio to amplify uh, the client's uh, outcomes. And here, because we have the uh, every round, the new dense client the model update mostly updates the, the zero weights in the sparse uh, server model. So when we subtract it, it re zeroes out the non-zero weights in the sparse server model. So which approximates the the sparse client's model here. 
And then we can take the client re learning rate out. And then it becomes a, a gradient on the local data for the clients. And essentially because we have the uh, global sparse model approximates the global dense model. And here we get the vanilla factory learning aggregation function. So here, this function here, we can see uh, the overall learning rate is a learning ratio together with the cl uh, client learning, learning rate. So, so in the next few slides, I will show you some evaluation of this process. So we implemented a complement specification with TensorFlow and the Flower. We used the two data sets. The first one is the Twitter data set, and the second one is the feminist image data set. We have two models uh, used. The first one is the sentiment an analysis, which classify a Twitter message into negative, positive, or neutral. So in this model, we use the pre-trained distilbert and the two dense layers. This is a relatively small model. And the second model is an image classification model. We use two CNN layers and the two dense layers to classify the um, image in families, the two data set to, to one of the 62 classes. So this is a, this model we consider it as a relatively larger data set. We have the two uh, no, larger larger model. We have the two models to check uh, if there are any difference. So we use process on we use complement specification process on different size of the models. We have the two baselines here. The first one is the PQSU which includes a structured pruning model quantization and a selective updating. The second one is a prune FL, which uh, firstly prune at the selected clients and also do the for, for future further pruning during the further learning process. And it, it can update the model size to minimize the estimated training time. So in this slide, I've shown you some uh, comparisons results between complement specification, vanilla factory learning and the baselines. We have the two applications here and the blue lines is our process and the red line is a vanilla factory learning. The other two lines are the baselines. As we see from the two figures, uh, uh, our process of complement specification approximates uh, vanilla factory learning and the one interesting observation here is uh, uh, through this uh, smaller model. So in the initial round, the performance uh, dropped a lot in our process. This is due to re remove the, some weights uh, from the global, global model. However, uh, this process can gradually recover from the performance job eventually through the training process, our process can still approximate the vanilla factory learning uh, performance. And uh, also when we zoom in the, the learning curve, as we see uh, uh, our process has a lower fluctuation than vanilla factory learning. This is a benefit for model selection when we do not have a representative uh, validation data set. So with our process, it's a safer just to use a current random model. However, in vanilla factor learning, especially we do not have full participation from all the clients. Uh, the performance uh, fluctuates a lot. And if we do not have a validation data set to select the, the best model, it's, uh, it's quite possible if we just use the current model of uh, the model current run, it will not perform well. So in this slide, I will show you the effectiveness, effectiveness of our process of, uh, by using the lower overhead pruning. So we have two, two applications. The blue lines is, uh, is uh, our global sparse model and that the red lines is a aggregated dense global model. 
as we can see, global sparse model outperformed the uh, aggregated uh, dense model with less fluctuation. And this indicates that even simply removing some uh, low magnitude weights uh, uh, can effectively, uh, effectively animate the noise in the aggregated model. So in this slide, I will show you some uh, communication and communication cost saving from our methods. We uh, run experiments over different uh, server model sparsity here. And then we uh, check the average client's model sparsity over the communication runs here. And also these, uh, these two tables here, we also compute the flop saves saved on the server because we use a sparse model in our process. So here in our process, uh, the, the server sparse model and the client sparse, sparse model complement each other. However, in practice, uh, we, we, we observe that not all the weights get updated, uh, not all the uh, zero weights get updated by the clients. And the clients uh, just update a smaller portion of the uh, complement part of the server sparse, mo sparse model. That's why the, the, the client spar model sparsity is always low, as low as 93% uh, uh, sparsity. So from these tables we see uh, uh, in our process, we can save communication between the clients and the server bidirectionally, and also save the computation on the device. So uh, in this slide, I show you the accuracy versus different model, server model sparsity we run over the experiments. And uh, we see uh, with different models, server model sparsity, we can achieve a good model accuracy. However, there is a trade-off between the uh, server model accuracy and also the uh, versus uh, model performance. And we can choose the, the, the model sparsity, desired models, uh, server model sparsity for our application. Okay, this is the conclusion. And our process complement sparsification is a practical low overhead model pruning for factory learning. It helps adoption of battery learning on resource constrained mobile and IoT devices. And uh, we, in this process, we have the server and the clients create and exchange sparse and complementary subsets of the dense models. And uh, we achieve up to 93% bi-directional communication re uh, overhead reduction and about 49% uh, the computation overhead reduction on device. We achieve a comparable model performance as a vanilla factor learning, and also we outperform the baselines. Thank you. Thanks so much. It was a great talk. Um, I, I was wondering, um, uh, this work was presented back in February, and so that means you probably submitted it earlier in late last year. And so yeah. since then, um, how have you pushed this work uh, forward? Have you gone into a different direction or have you been advancing it? Maybe thinking about how you can apply it to different settings. I'm just curious. Um, right now, after, after this work, I have, we haven't uh, think about how to extend it. But, uh, but right now, I think this work right now is just a framework, not much fancy things that happens in this process. I think a lot of things can be done. For example, personalization can be added and we can, yeah, tweak some small things, uh, yeah, to improve this process. For example, cool. the, the proning process right now is to simply remove the low magnitude weights and uh, it can be extended to different methods to, 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 to do the uh, server model proning yeah, without uh, Without server data, that's one way we can improve it. A better way, not just to simply remove the low magnitude weights. Yeah, that's also possible. Very interesting. Um, 
Yeah, and then what, what are you most excited about using or expanding federated learning in general? Is there a particular direction that you want to see it advance? Uh, I think uh, I think uh, one thing missing, uh, yeah, yeah, here is uh, is in federated learning right now we assume the data to be static. It means uh, data do not change over runs. Mm -hmm. So for all the clients, we do, uh, we put all the data together and uh, just the one data set that the client's data do not change over time. But in practice, in real life, uh, we usually, it, it is not the case. We want to perform the training as, a, as the clients collecting data, not just uh, the static data. So when we have a dynamic data set, uh, we we may also do not want the data to be keep accumulating on the clients. Uh, maybe due to the resource constraint, we do not want to the client to uh, leave so much uh, so many data on the on the on the device or on the mobile or IoT devices. Or uh, so in that way, it's uh, one thing I think. Of, in fact, learning is a lot of people, not too much work on down on this direction. It's, it will be interesting to 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 work on this direction. It's That's like really interesting. Yeah, I can see that. You might even encounter situations where when you select some clients, those clients might have um, data from the old distribution, depending on how fast the data arrives to them. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like well, really interesting. Yeah, thanks for that food for thought. Really, very really fascinating. Uh, I'm, um, yeah, thank, thank, thank you for the talk. Uh, we're, we're now going to move on to our next speaker, Danny Ma. Danny Ma is uh, at the University of Cambridge. He's been working for um, quite some time on how you can federate various kinds of trees. Trees are various uh, methods that allow us to build a model that is not a neural network based, but is uh, much more akin to things like XGBoost and even to a degree like decision trees. Um, so he is going to now talk to us about uh, his ideas and how you can do this and do it in a way that's even more privacy preserving. So again, thank you, Danny, for um, taking part in Flower Monthly uh, this time around. Yeah, thank you, Nick. And I will share my screen. Yeah, so, um, so now I'm only sharing my slide, but not a full screen. So let's see if this uh, will work. Yeah, sure. For the time. first few minutes, I will give a brief, uh, brief overview of uh, why we need actually boost, and what is actually boost, and our new development method. Then for the last five minutes, I will give like a short short demo on our code and how to run the code to train the federal actually boost. And so first, I will talk about our motivations. So existing effort research mainly focuses on neural networks. For example, if we think about the mainstream strategies like federal averaging and the FedProx, they all assume we are using neural networks. However, like in some cases, an actual boost is also very powerful. On top of data sets, this is under 10K examples. Because three, three studies have proved that an uh, actual boost can also perform neural network on small or medium sized data sets. And also in addition, in the industry, there is a growing need to deploy a federal actual boost on tasks such as survival analysis and financial threat detection. And so these situations raise the need and to train a federal actually boost. And the current research on federal actually boost mainly defines two settings. The first one is the horizontal one. In this setting, clients' data sets have identical feature space but different sample IDs. The central server sends the global models to all clients and they aggregate them, update the model parameters after each communication run. In the vertical setting, the concepts of passive parties and one active party were introduced, where passive parties and active parties share identical simple space, but, but, different, uh, but different feature space. And as only the active party has a data labels, it's natural to access in the server. And both settings have practical applications. One example of the horizontal application is in the healthcare industry, and where multiple hospitals have distinct patient IDs, but share the same features like and blood test results or medical history. And by collaborating, they can train a model to predict a, a, a patient's disease outcome. And on the other hand, and one example of a vertical setting can be found in the financial industry. The central bank and the credit reporting agencies have shared customer IDs but different features. 
uh, for example, like a county history or credit history. And by training together, uh, they can uh, train a credit scoring model on all clients and to predict the financial, risk, uh, financial risks. And our work focused on a more common setting, which is the horizontal setting. And although the horizontal setting remains to be more common, the training of a horizontal fire strategy boost actually turns out to be harder. To understand why we need to reveal the fundamentals of the actual boost. Action boost is an additive, uh, additive assemble model. It adapts forward stage-wise regression and constantly there's new trees to fix the residue of the previous tree until a stop condition is met. Suppose there are M trees in our tree assemble and given a data point XI, the final prediction is given by summing, summing the predictions of all M trees with a fixed learning risk eta, which is uh, this, uh, this symbol looks like N. And this figure provides an, provides an example for better understanding. We have a regression task in which we want to predict the daily food consumption of a dog. And we have two trees in our, in our tree assemble. And we add the prediction outcomes and of all of all these two trees to give the uh, to give the results of one single dog, for example, the dog type uh, number two and dog type number four. Mm, the trend of action boost is done in an additive in a sequential manner, which means the tree FT plus one is always trained after the tree FT. And to train a single tree, we first calculate the first uh, the first order gradient and the second order hashings of all the hash samples as shown in equation three. And from the root to leaf nodes, the best splitting points can be found in equation two by, in, by maximizing this thing called the split scan. The split scan as every node is calculated with regards to the sums of the gradients and the sums of hashings of all the hard points. And then we partition the gradients and the hashings into the left and the right and of the, the node to find uh, according to the splitting points feature constraint. Yeah, so why is the training of a horizontal failure to actually boost harder? This is because this is because finding the optimal split condition of a single tree depends on the order of a data samples. As we see in equation two, we iterate the feature sets and the partition the data into left and right according to feature constraints. Therefore, as the clients share the same simple addition in the vertical setting, the possible parties only need to share the order of their samples to actual party, without revealing the actual values of the gradient and the hashings. And however, since the sample IDs are different across all clients in the horizontal setting, in other words, the intern set IJ is decentralized across all clients. So at every speaking point, each class needs to transmit the gradient hashings and sample space and conditions based on the future constraints to a server to find the optimal splitting condition. And only in this way, we can know the partition of the data samples into the left and the right for each class unique simple ID. To calculate the global GO and GR and the global uh, HO and HR required by, uh, required by equation two. And consequently, by sharing gradients and hashings, we, we, identify, we, we identify two problems that must be solved. The first problem is the Pernod level communication frequency. The server needs to communicate with all clients at every, every speaking point. Then we denote, we, de we denote the depth of each tree as L and the number of trees in a tree assemble as M. The number of nodes in a tree assemble can scale up to M to two, N times two to the power of L, and so is the number of communication runs. As a train action boost model is common to have a depth of eight and 500 trees, the number of communication runs can reach up to 100,000. Moreover, in, a real, in a real applications of federal action boost, it is possible for a server to connect more than one round of, one, one of communication run um, per, per node because we need to uh, carry out extra cryptographic calculations to protect the privacy. So this high communication overhead is unacceptable, is unacceptable for practical uses of actually boost. And the second concern is the serious privacy issue. The sharing of gradients is proved to be insecure by previous works because uh, the data can be reconstructed by sharing the gradients and hashings, uh, which violates the core principle of better learning, which is the privacy protection. Yeah, so in this work, we ask the fundamental question, if it's, if, if it's, it's possible not to rely on the sharing of gradients and hashings you know, to construct a horizontal federal action boost. And in this way, we can simultaneously decrease the uh, panel level combination frequency and also boost up the privacy concern. 
uh, the privacy protection. We find, this, we find this to be possible by formulating two important insights. And the first one is, as local clients think of as make it genius, each tree makes different amount of mistakes. And in this case, using a fixed learning rate may be too weak. Consider the example in this figure. We have an XBoost uh, model with M trees, and the model is trained on data sets for regression task. We send this XGBoost model to two other clients and evaluate it on their respective local data sets. And now we observe the prediction outcomes of the first of the, of the first three trees in the tree assemble. And given two data points from the data, data, data sets one and two respectively, and they have the same back, and they have the same ground truth, which is 100. And for the first tree F1, it gives a good initial prediction for X for data, for data points XB, but not for data points XA. And the second and the third tree, on the other hand, they sufficiently correct, correct the error made by the first tree in the case for XA, but not for XB. So in this case, we may want a higher, higher running rate uh, for, for the tree F, uh, F, F2 and F3 and for data points X1, but a, but a lower learning rate for a tree F2 and F3 for data points XB. So in this case, a fixed learning rate is too weak. And our second insight is, the data heterogeneity causes the train exposed model on different clients' local data sets to convert to a local optima that is far away from each other. And consequently, given an anything data sample, this exposed tree sample outputs different prediction outcomes. However, among all tree samples, some can give more accurate predictions compared to others because, because the underlying, underlying distribution of the, of the anything data points may be closer to some distribution. So in this case, we may want to apply a weighted sum on all kinds on all on all three samples prediction outcomes. It is worth noting that this approach is also used by federated average and federated blocks uh, in the same way as they aggregate the model parameters. And in their work, they have given theoretical convergence for uh, for the for the approach of using weighted weighted average. So to facilitate our into our insights. The, the final prediction results giving an arbitrary data, data sample with a feature dimension D is calculated by the weighted sum of all trees from all clients as shown in this figure. Each vertical tree chain is a tree sample built by one client where W is the learning rate assigned to each tree and the ZK is a, is a weight applied to balance each um, tree sample's prediction outcome. We refer to this system as an aggregated tree sample. But now we have one question. That says, how do we make the make the learning rates of everything uh, learnable during the training of actually boosts? And we find we can make this possible by transforming the aggregated tree samples into a one layer 1D convolutional neural network. In the first 1D convolutional layer, the, the inputs are the, prediction, are the prediction outcomes of all tree samples. This small size model is interpretable. The kernel size and the stride of the 1D convolution are equal to the number of trees in each, in each client's tree assemble. Thus, each channel of the 1D convolution can, can be understood as a learning rate that can be applied. And the number of channels is the total number of learning rate strategy, strategies and that we can apply and serve, as a back, and serve as a backup. And the classification head, which is the fully, connect, which is a fully connected layer, contains the weighting factor ZK to balance the, to, to, to balance the prediction outcomes of all clients' uh, spilled tree assemble. And here is our full pipeline. Each client, uh, in the left part, each client first train first trains its local actual train model, and the server then aggregates and and initializes the CN model. After receiving the aggregated tree samples, all clients calculate the prediction outcomes given the aggregated tree sample on their local data samples, and then the and, and then and the prediction outcomes and are, are used to are, are used to train the one CNN. It is, it is worth noting that the clients only need to build the expose tree symbol uh, as round one, and the aggregated tree symbol is fixed after round one. Uh, for the for, for the federated training of the 1D1 layer CNN, um, we use the federated averaging, which is the most basic and standard uh, FPO protocols. And finally, uh, the trained global federated XGBoost model contains all clients locally and um, builds XGBoost, XGBoost models and the, and the globally trained 1D1 layer CNN. And we we'll name our approach as FED XGP LLR, which stands for a federated XGBoost model with learnable learning rates. And compared to previous methods, 
our approach offers two key advantages. The first one is privacy protection. The clients only need to share the constructed tree symbol to a server. The sharing of the grid and hashes which may leak sensitive information is not required. The second is a uh, is much lower communication overhead because our method is our method and the and the induced overhead is independent of the data set size and any hyperparameter related to a train actually boost. And in practice, we find 10 communication rounds to be sufficient for our model to, to reach the performance comparable to state of the art method. And then one question is, and some people may argue that the sharing of a tree model also, also leak privacy. However, we think that in the case of factor, in, in the case of factor learning, in, in, in any way, we, we are sharing the global model. So the privacy con the sort of privacy concern of sharing the tree assemble is much less than sharing the gradients. And that's all for and that's all for the method. And now I will give a brief uh, a brief overview, a, a short demo of the code uh, which is released to Flower community. Yeah, so this code is uh, is the same one as the one that released on the on the Flower. And this one is the same uh, Google Code App file. Uh, so to so to run this piece of code, you only need to uh, to click each block across. Okay, yeah. So we we already set up uh, every uh, every every environment uh, for Python. So you do not need to set up uh, anything by yourself. Yeah. So uh, uh, so now I will go over each block, and the first block is the is the setup environment, and I will skip them for now because I already installed the environments on my local machine, and then we will import every modulus um, for training, and and also 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 this one. And then this block is all utility all utility functions, and that will be used for to, to, to train a federal data boost. And some of them are more, more important, and some of them are less important. And I will come back to this block later. And and here we, we will select the data sets we want to use. And here I select the task type to be binary classification and the data sets to be code RNA. And then we um, when then we pro pre processed um, pre processed the uh, uh, the data sets. And in this block, we will do the federated linear partitioning um, for, for all clients. And then we will define the hyperparameters uh, for the for the federated learning. And here I define the number of clients to be five, and the number of tree samples in each client to be one hundred. And then in this section, for comparison purpose, we first build a global action boost model on all clients' data sets. And we can see the task, the task accuracy is around 0 0.9, 0 0.966. And then we also simulate the action boost uh, model on each client's local data sets. And we can see that the accuracy is slightly lower and around 0 0.96. And, and following this, we will define the CNN, uh, which is used to train the learnable learning rates. And we'll also uh, define the training and the test, fun the, the test function here. And then we'll define our customized FU cli uh, 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 flower client. And, and what's, really what's really important is that we we'll make revisions to the initializations of the clients, uh, which we have the, the, the each client's um, tra the train loader, test loader, the CID, also the trees which will be constructed from the from local data sets. And we'll also overwrite the get uh, parameters, parameters and the set parameters function, because we also need to share the tree assembles in addition to those CNNs, CNNs uh, model parameters. And then after this, we'll define our customized uh, FUO server. Uh, in this section, we many uh, make revisions and, and to the function called uh, called fits run and and the uh, guess initial parameters because we need to share the tree examples. And other all follow the all follow the, the default uh, code of the Flower framework. And finally, we will define our customized server side evaluation function to do evaluation. And then we can define our static starts experiments function to train our file tree boost. Yes, and at the very end, when we can click this block and to run our code, 
and and I I already ran the code uh, to to save time, and we can see that after after uh, twenty rounds, the final accuracy uh, achieved something around uh, zero point nine six four, which is higher than the local the the locally built actually boost model, and slightly lower than global um, built actually boost. Yes, and and also uh, one final thing that you can access this piece of code and by clicking the flower example, the quick start example, uh, fire actually boots. And there, there's also a, a blog post which you can read to get a better insight and for explanation. Yeah, and that's all for my talk and, and thank you for your time. That was wonderful. Not only did you have a talk, but you also had this uh, great code walkthrough, which we, we know that many people enjoy so they can see both like what's the concept, but also how do they, um, how can they easily take that concept and start to use it themselves? So it's really cool. Thank you so much, Danny. Uh, that uh, brings us uh, to the end of uh, Flower Monthly. Uh, I'd like to um, thank both our speakers. We should give them a little round of applause, even though it's a little awkward and online, but you know, thank you guys for coming. It's always great to see um, contributions from the community and then sharing it back to the community. That's really cool. Uh, let me just uh, close uh, proceedings. Uh, with um, a slide that shows us uh, the next Flower Monthly. Um, interestingly, this Flower Monthly will occur at um, the Flower Summit, which will be the end of May. It's May 30th and 31st, but we will run it out monthly uh, a week or so later. i uh, begin with some, some great uh, additional speakers to, to present to you all. Um, one, uh, one additional thing that you might be able to find useful and keeping up to date with all the various events and uh, new pieces of content and things that are happening in the Flower ecosystem is um, a subscribable calendar. Um, and so uh, you'll find inside the um, Flower Monthly um, Slack channel, for example, um, a, a link uh, to a sub subscribable calendar that has events on it, such as this one and other important events, such as the Flower Summit, and we'll be populating it with other events of, of this kind. Um, so feel free to use that. Uh, you can also find this calendar via um, the Flower um, website um, too, I'm sure. <clears throat> but um, that brings us to the close of Flower Monthly for this month of May. Next one will be on June the 7th, starting at 1600 UTC. Um, if you want to find out, uh, find out the videos related to this in earlier Flower Monthlies, you can visit uh, the website or go to our YouTube channel. Um, if you want to discuss how we can improve this event, there is the Slack channel under the Flower Workspace. Um, and if you're not part of the, the Slack Workspace yet, you're missing out on some really cool things, cool discussions, the ability to ask a bit of Q&A and interact with your fellow community members. Um, so feel free to, to consider taking that opportunity up. It's also that URL is at the bottom there. Um, and with that, I'll start to close. But again, thank you for our um, guest speakers. Thank you to everyone who came today and thank you to the um, Flower Core team also, you can see there um, at the top uh, of my screen at least. So um, yeah, have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone. It's been wonderful talking to you about Flower for this month. Um, take care. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.